Um, for those of you who this is home, it's great to be home today with you all. And uh, I want to start by kind of just saying something out loud. I wonder if you get this. I certainly feel this sometimes. But have you ever said or thought even, they'll get what's coming to them in the end? Ah, huh? They'll get a taste of their own medicine. They're going to get their just desserts. I don't say that like as a normal thing, but that's the old phrase, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I understand that sentiment, right? And it sounds like some of you do too. And uh, it's hard, right? Because on the one hand, we, we see things and we're like, man, wouldn't it be great if... Um, wouldn't it be great if the world was a little bit nicer, you know, or people were just a little bit more self-aware or, or people actually cared, you know, or when I'm on my commute, people didn't cut me off and then flip me off, you know, like these sorts of things. They're going to get theirs for sure, right? Yeah, of course. Like we, we are, are kind of wired in such a way that um, it's, it's always them, by the way. You know what I mean? Like they all get theirs. But if you're the person cutting them off, you're, it's, it's fine, you know? Or if you're the person who said what was on your mind in a kind of mean tone, you know, it's fine because you're just telling the truth or whatever, right? And so like, we have to be self-reflective. We've got to really wrestle this down. But man, I certainly know that feeling. And uh, you know, sometimes it's maybe a little bit more from a place of empathy or hope for someone, you know? It's like, I, I see so much in that person. I see so much potential in that person. I see so much possibility in that person. If they would only dot, 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 you know? If they would only not waste the gifts they have, if they would only not waste the life they have. And I think sometimes that can come from a very good and, and, and just sort of a place of like, ah, oh, I want more for that person. And, and I think we need to also flip the tables and ask ourselves questions about our own lives and how we're using what we have, using the resources we have, the, the opportunities we have, the sort of dynamics and social realities that we step into. Because it's easy for us, if we're not careful, to have areas in our life that are wasted, to have areas in our life that could have been so much better, could have flourished in such a more beautiful way, but we sort of squandered an opportunity. And so here's what I wanna talk about today with you all, is I wanna talk about this big thought I have here. And it's this, you can waste your life on comfort or listen for God's invitation to comfort others. You can waste your life on comfort or listen for God's invitation to comfort others. I, I think this is going to make some sense in a minute, but essentially what we're saying is like, we, we all have what we have and, and we're invited to be good stewards of what we have. And oftentimes we, we can fall into these sort of patterns where we, we get to a place in our lives where we really could be um, doing more to be others oriented, to be um, aware of the needs of other people. And part of the challenge is not only that our own awareness isn't tapped into the needs of others, but here's the other part. There's this element of it that I think is so crucial that we learn to be people who are, as, as I say up on the screen, listening for God's invitation. Listening for what God would invite us to do so that life isn't wasted in our daily moment to moment experience. And so that's what I wanna do today. I wanna explore this through looking at another parable. We're in a series called Parables, Jesus the Storyteller. And what we're gonna try to do together is explore what it might look like to listen to God well, to listen to Jesus well, and to see how that sets us up to love others well. So here we go. So we're in a series on parables. This, uh, I want to share just a quick defining quote. Uh, we looked at this two weeks ago, and this is what um, we used as one of our examples of how to understand a parable. A parable is a literary performance in which a story, example, or image from our world of experience 
or imagination is compared to God's kingdom. So a parable is a story which sets up something that is this worldly, and it either looks at an example that we can see that's just like everyday life example, or it's something we can imagine. And these are all down to earth, gritty, and have a very clear point. And so today's parable is going to be in Luke chapter 16, and we're going to be looking for the idea of the kingdom of God is like, because every single parable that you'll ever experience as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, all of them implicitly, some explicitly, are simply trying to do one thing to say the kingdom of God is like dot, dot, dot. The kingdom of God is like dot, dot, dot. And so we're gonna kind of set ourselves up in Luke chapter 16 to notice what's going on. So the first half of Luke 16, there is a parable about someone who messes up when it comes to uh, stewardship. And so this parable as a punchline, it's like you've got to steward God's resource as well. And then there's an audience and this is the reaction of part of the audience. And so Luke 16 verse 14 goes like this. Excuse me. It says, the Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. So they heard this lesson on stewardship and they scoffed at him, at Jesus. Then Jesus, then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. So Jesus here is kind of just saying, look, it's clear that you don't have a lens for seeing or ears to hear that the kingdom of God is like someone who is doing the right thing with God's resources because you seem to really love being in charge. You seem to really love your money as it says here in the passage. And God knows, like God understands something deeper than your public piety. It's your inward disposition, your own formation. And Jesus will keep going in verse 16. It says, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets were your guides. So up until a couple of days ago, basically, when John the Baptist was doing his thing, the final sort of um, Old Testament-ish prophet, John the Baptist, is doing his thing, you have had the law, the Torah, Moses's sort of like encapsulated teachings and the stories from that era. And you have had the prophetic books and you have these and this is how God speaks. But now Jesus says, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. And so Jesus says, there's something happening that's even more, and eventually we'll come to figure out that it's Jesus in the flesh that is that more, that's gonna take what Moses and the prophets have done and said about how to live well in the world and take them to their next stage in God's redemptive story. And so that's the setup. That's the setup for this. And so you can understand like this idea of you can waste your life on comfort or listen for God's invitation to comfort others, why we're kind of going this direction. And what we get next is a parable that's sort of famous and sort of odd and sort of confusing at times. And uh, for lack of a better title, it's often called the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And it's interesting, if we keep this idea of the kingdom of God is like, what we're gonna notice, and what's really helpful to notice, is um, that first of all, Jesus is going to, in this parable we'll read, adapt common folk themes of stories that are generated in the ancient world, many of them in the Jewish world itself, about this idea of they'll get theirs in the end. 
This idea of an afterlife scenario where a rich man is now in poverty, a poor person is now not, right? These sort of reversal thing. And we're gonna see this, but it, it's really important to say a couple of things. Um, one of the things that I think was just overwhelming as I studied this week is that over and over again, commentators, biblical scholars, theologians, they almost all said one thing that is very important for us to have in our minds. Be careful when you read this parable because two things, it's gonna challenge you, but also be careful not to hear a parable as a literal telling of the afterlife. So we're gonna read this and we're gonna notice this sort of setup that Jesus is doing, but we need to be very careful that we don't overread a parable into something so literal that we now have a theology of the afterlife from a story that Jesus is telling that essentially we could say, once upon a time there was too. Does that make sense? There's other places to go for that in the New Testament, but overwhelmingly, scholars on all ends of the hell debate or whatever seem to say, hey, be careful here. Jesus' point isn't to give you a doctrine and experience of what heaven and hell are like. Are we following? One other nugget here is this is a parable that is taught from the perspective of Jesus and his perspective of now, not our now, but first century now. Does that make sense? And not only first century now, pre-resurrected Jesus now. We follow in that chronology? And so even then, um, this post-resurrection sort of thing hasn't even happened yet. And so the idea of heaven, hell, the afterlife is still sort of in its Old Testament space, whatever we might think of that. How's that for a setup? Are we good? You ready to read it? It's a really good one. Um, so let's do this. So here's my kind of big summary of what to keep in mind. It's this. Um, the kingdom of God is like the old folk stories where there's a greedy rich man and a suffering poor man who reverse their status in the afterlife. Here's that story. Luke chapter 16 starts in 19. And it goes like this. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen, who feasted luxurious every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. So there's a rich man in the story. And this rich man is clothed in purple, which to get purple in the ancient world is a big deal. You actually had to go to this part of the Mediterranean where you would um, get these tiny, tiny, tiny little snails and then they would be smashed and purple goo comes out. I'm not joking about this, by the way. Purple goo comes out when you smash the snail and that is the uh, refined into a dye. And it's so hard to get enough of that that only rich people had purple things. We following? And so it's a big deal. And it's kind of gross if you think about it, but it's a big deal, right? Uh, and, and also the, the fine linen here is like the most expensive linen that you can find in the ancient world as well. And so this is like an exuberantly rich person that Jesus is trying to have them imagine. And he is feasting. He has so much food. Things are falling to the table or falling to the ground beneath the table. And here you have on the other end of it, at the gate of this property, whoa, that was a, <laughs> a fly who's slowly maybe meeting its end. I'm not gonna hurt you, just go away. Okay, um, wouldn't it be kind of traumatizing for someone if I just kill someone? Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't a yellow jacket because I would be jumping like a little baby. So uh, here we are. So at the gate of this property, is now Lazarus. Now, what we're gonna to find today is very fascinating. This is the only parable in any gospel account where a character is named. That's it. Lazarus, and then in a, the next passage, we'll get to Abraham. The only time names are used. What it seems to be doing is really centering on 
hey, there's that rich guy and then there's this Lazarus. There's this humanizing of the person happening. He is covered in sores and dogs come and are licking at the sores to get their own nourishment, which is gross, right? Like this is a horrible, horrible situation. It's like the wild dogs are like vultures that have circled. Keeps going. The poor man, verse 22. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. Now, Abraham being the patriarch from the Old Testament. Father Abraham who had many, many sons and daughters. Many sons had father. Okay. Um, The rich man, some of you get that and some of you are like, what? It's fine. It's fine. The rich man also died and was buried. So they both die in the story while being tormented in the place of the dead. The word there for dead is Hades, which is how the Greek, ver- this is going to be weird, the Greek version of the Old Testament of the time uh, translated the grave essentially from the Hebrew, right? So it borrows this word Hades, um, which is in some of Greek mythology, a, a place of the Um, the underworld, right? This terrible place. But the Old Testament seems to use it as the place of the dead. And so while being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I am suffering in this flame. Apparently in the story, Jesus is, you know, setting up this scenario where somehow Abraham and Lazarus are in sort of a happier state in the afterlife. And um, this man is now in a sad state in the afterlife, but they're able to communicate, but there's this gap between them. So they don't get close, but they're communicating back and forth. Again, Another note, like don't build a theology around a story that's not meant to be a theology of heaven and hell. Does that make sense, right? Like this is nowhere else in the biblical tradition. Um, But there's this sense in which this man who had had so much, so much as far as money and good um, nourishment and all the things you can imagine is now experiencing the exact opposite. And some, some commentators say, and notice what he does. He knows Lazarus's name. So it wasn't like he was leaving his property and didn't notice that Lazarus in his lifetime needed help. It was, he would leave his property enough, see him there and do nothing and saw him so often there that he knows him by name. This is tragic, absolutely tragic. But now he says, hey, send him to me. Treat him like a servant and have him come to me so that I cannot suffer this terrible suffering that I'm going through right now. What do we do with that? Well, again, we see like the waste of a life. We see a man who has just wasted his life and now the fortunes have been reversed. I'm gonna keep going. Verse 25, but Abraham said, he says it so kindly, child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevasse, 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 how do you say it? Crevasse, crevasse. Yeah, I say both. I just never, you know, crevasse. It sounds so much more formal. I'm sorry. Um, So, moreover, a great crevasse has been (laughs) fixed, right, between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you can't, cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. Okay, so there is this great reversal that is now clear and it is fixed. It is what it is. They can't fix the situation for the guy who's suffering. They can't help him. And they're being very clear. Abraham is saying, look, 
You're getting what you didn't get in your lifetime, just like Lazarus is getting. And what I think is so important, again, is this idea that the rich man had all the opportunity to be good, to be kind, to live into the kingdom of God that was emerging, and yet didn't. And just saw Lazarus and said, oh, hey, Lazarus, and walked on by day after day after day. I'm gonna give a, kind of like a sub point. I'm gonna have a couple of these today. Jesus calls us to love others more than we love being comfortable. Jesus just does. Like he calls us to love others more than we love being comfortable. And, and it's easy, by the way, in this story to, to be like, oh, that rich man, he's so rude. He's so bad. He's so self-absorbed. He has so much in comparison to this guy. Um, I, wanna, I wanna keep it real this morning. Not everyone here, maybe, but a lot of people here probably. I'm not talking about the disposition of your heart and your sort of like what you do with this reality, but here it is. Most people in the North American context are more, have more in common with the rich man in the parable than they do Lazarus. That's me. That's you. Now, not the character qualities of the rich man, but the contrast of comfort. Most of us in the Western world, if we're gonna be honest and allow the parable to impact us, we probably need to start with the rich man and identifying our lives in comparison to the rich man first. And then once we've done due diligence, once we've sat in that uncomfortable sort of sense of like, oh, then we, we probably could have permission to say, and there are times in my life where I feel like Lazarus. Absolutely. That's absolutely real. And if you're here and you're like, you know what, actually, like because of where my life is and what's going on in my story, like, Laz like I am more like Lazarus, bless you, talk to us. Like we want to be for you. And, and, and we know that whatever our lot in life, when comfort gets in the way of love, we've lost the storyline. We've just lost. We've missed out on the opportunity to be the kind of people that when they look at our lives, as people look at our lives together, they could honestly say the kingdom of God is like those people over there who are doing the stuff. But comfort, comfort is one of the idols of our age. And I like comfort. I'll say it uh, again, I've said it before. I'd take a hotel over a tent any day of the week. I like comfort, you know? I don't mind sweating as long as I know the shower is very close. You know what I mean, right? I like comfort. And look, this isn't a knock on the fact that some of us are wired and we kind of enjoy being comfortable in certain parts of our lives. But here's the deal. When comfort gets in the way of love, we've lost all the possible goodness that we could be stepping into with God. And we're wasting the possibilities with God that are before us. The story's gonna keep going in uh, verse 27. The rich man said, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so that they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. They have Moses and the prophets. The same thing Jesus speaks about the Pharisees right before this parable. Now, the parable itself is saying you are missing the point. It's not that you, Mr. Rich Man, didn't have enough information. You had more than enough information in front of you. You had all that the Bible teaches. By the way, over and over and over again, if we just look at the first five books of the Bible and we look at the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, it's B 
Be good to the sojourner among you. Be good to the immigrant. Be good to the outsider. If someone comes to your home, feed them, clothe them. Treat people this way. Treat people well over and over again. It's like Jesus says, the center of the the law, the center of the Old Testament was love God and love neighbor. And if you did those two things for Jesus and his teaching, then you've done all of the things. And so what's the use, right? Abraham simply says, they have the resources. Your five brothers, as much as you don't want them to end up like you, they have everything they need in order to do what is right. They can listen to God's voice through scripture or they can turn off their ears and not. And so, what do we do? Because now it's like, really? This rich man is like, really? Verse 30, the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, Lazarus, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. They will repent. Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. And now we've got a punchline and a half. Pharisees, you don't know, but I'm about to be raised from the dead and you still aren't going to believe me because you are not listening to what God is doing among you. And if in the story, someone goes and says, hey, here's a miraculous sign. Here's something different. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm convinced. Like, are you really, are you really raised from the dead or was this some trick, right? And we start rationalizing and rationalizing just like these guys would have rationalized their way out of the commands of God throughout the Old Testament and in obviously to the New Testament to live a life that helps your neighbor flourish. And so one last kind of sub point here. When we listen to God, we'll discern the next right thing to do. When we listen to God, we'll discern the next right thing to do. You and I have an advantage that the people depicted in the parable and the people Jesus is teaching actually did not have. If you are a follower of Jesus and you've given your your life over to him, you have the spirit of Jesus Christ living in your innermost self. You have access to the voice of God directly. Now that can be manipulated in all kinds of ways that kind of counteract what God is actually teaching in scripture. You can use that to manipulate others. And if you are, it's not the voice of God, it's someone else's voice. Get away from that voice, right? But, but for those of us who are sincerely doing all that we can to know Jesus, to follow him, to live lives that are empowered by God's spirit and be propelled into the world, We don't just have Moses and the prophets. We have Moses, the prophets, the New Testament witness, and we have the great witness, the Holy Spirit living in us. And each and every day, we have the opportunity to be awakened to life with him. So when we listen to God, we're able to say, you know what? I've been walking past this gate of my house day after day after day, just saying, hey, Lazarus, hope you have a good day. Maybe today I'm gonna do something to get him medical care. Maybe today I'm gonna do something to make sure that no matter what is going on, I'm gonna be the kind of person who says, hey, here's a plate of food. Maybe eventually he comes in and eats with us once in a while. You know, like, like my point being this, The rich man could not hear what God would have had him do. But those of us who are in Christ, followers of Jesus, we have zero excuse for choosing comfort over comforting others. 
We have zero excuse. You can waste your life on comfort or listen for God's invitation to comfort others. And so here's what I want to leave us with. Like, what do we do? Well, this is a a two-part message in a sense. Like two sort of emphases are coming out. I hope you're hearing them. The first one is that we are called to be people who listen to God well so that we can be activated in life and live a life that loves well. And the second part of that, of course, is that loving well part, that how do I, now that I'm hearing from God, I'm hearing from Jesus, I know that my life is to be spent on the well-being of others, and so how am I actually living into that? And it might not be as extreme of situations as we get in the parable, but man, if a love for other isn't at the core of how we are applying what we're hearing from God, we gotta rethink what we're hearing from God maybe we're not hearing well. And I think that's one of the things that I hope this school year, as we step further into this um, kind of season together, that we dive deeper into. How do we hear Jesus? How do we hear God? How do we position our lives in such a way that maybe it's not constant, maybe it's hard, maybe we all hear God different ways, maybe we have different modes. Some of us hear here in a, in a way that's like, whoa, I can totally like in my heart and mind kind of sense this thing from God. And maybe some of us are like, man, when I'm in scripture, I just get this sense of conviction and I know that that's God's voice to me. And some of us are in nature and we're just walking and contemplating and saying, whoa, God, you are so big and you love me as someone who is so small. And that means you must love every small person, everything. How do I live for you, right? We all will hear God in unique ways, but here's the invitation in this season is to actually do what we can to position our lives to have our ears open to what God might want to say to us. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced something called the practices. Um, If you weren't here, this is a pathway that uh, we're inviting us as a church to practice the way of Jesus together with different emphases every month. And if you go to that website on the screen, uh, brentview.church slash the practices, we'll have each month a different sort of thematic set of curriculum where you can walk through these practices and kind of just grow in your own connection to God, your own connection to Jesus. And in the context of community with other people, this is why this is now integrated into all of our one group experiences. In the context of community, you can really spur each other on in a way that you start to just notice, whoa, I just feel more connected to Jesus than I ever have. And I feel more alive and I feel more connected to this pe- people, uh, this people, these people around me, right? Like I am just feeling so different because I have decided to position my life in such a way that I'm learning to listen with greater depth and openness and perhaps even a little bit more clarity. This week, if you have had a chance to follow the practices, and again, if you're in a one group, you'll start this journey over the next couple of weeks um, in a more formal way. But um, the prayer sort of journey is definitely on the website for anyone who wants to check it out. And this week, um, they actually are giving two practices for listening to God and hearing God's voice in our lives. There's two, I wanna put the first one These are ones you've probably heard of and maybe have even tried yourself. Um, The first one is called Lexio Divina, and it's a way of reading scripture as a source of um, prayer in your life. And it's such a helpful tool for just opening space to say, God, what would you have for me in this moment? It's a way of saying, God, I want to position myself prayerfully to hear scripture and then to hear what you might have for me. The second opportunity that they're inviting us to practice is called listening prayer. 
Listening prayer is simply taking space and saying, you know what? I have a lot to say to God. I wonder if God has anything that God wants to say to me. And I wonder how many of us actually ask that question. And I, I, I put myself on the hook here. What does God actually want to say to me? What would it look like if that kind of question was something that came to me more and more, but it wasn't just like an intellectual, like I wonder what God would say to me if, but rather like what does God have to speak into my life and what, what am I gonna do to just position a little bit of my time, a little bit of my week to be open to the fact that God is still speaking, God is still reaching towards me and inviting me to live a life that's not wasted, but is a life that looks like a small microcosm of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. One of the things we get to do together to really activate these things, you know, this idea that we can waste our life on comfort or listen for God's invitation to comfort others is uh, coming up on October 6th. We're gonna be doing Serve the City together. And this is an opportunity to do these two things, to pray, to look for, to notice God speaking as you're out doing your walk with your kind of smaller pocket of friends and community, or as you're serving here, doing various things to kind of help um, just propel God's mission into our neighborhood. That part of the journey is just simply saying, we're gonna be prayerful as we step into our community. And we're gonna notice if, if God puts Lazarus in front of us. We're gonna notice if there's just garbage that needs to be picked up. We're gonna just be open and notice to the fact that God is always working. And if we position our lives in a place where we can actually in interact and intercept some of those moments with God, what would our city be like? What would our lives be like? What would our world be like? be like. So you can waste your life on comfort or you can listen for God's voice and you can listen for his invitation. And so as we close, I want to just give us the opportunity to hear from Jesus together. I want to invite you to stand if you're able and we're going to pray. The worship team is going to come up. What would our lives be like if we listened well? And look, we're not always gonna hear, it's not always gonna be easy, but the wrestle itself to hear from God is totally transformational. So I'm gonna invite us into a posture of prayer. God, would you, during these next few minutes, as we sing to you, as we pray, as we ponder who you are, you open us up? Would we not be like the rich man who ignored your voice, who ignored the teachings of the Old Testament, the way that you were speaking to people? Would we not be like that? But would we be people who are alive because you are alive. That are open to what you might direct us towards, towards that next right opportunity. Who seek to listen. So that as we listen, we can learn to love like you love. and to be people who receive your love and experience our own transformation in the process. 
so Jesus right now we thank you that when we think of your kingdom that it's those who are lowly who are lifted up would we partner with you in loving like that Jesus, we worship you. It's in your name we pray.